Kia ora everybody. Um, welcome to the Now Crowds event on Auckland's water shortage. It's really great to have you all here um, given the quite challenging circumstances. Um, yeah, so just acknowledging, thank you all for showing up. Um, thank you all for being here and um, yeah, welcome, welcome to the event. Um, so call Brit, toku ingoa. Um, I hail from Tamaki Makoto. Um, and yeah, it's really lovely to be here with you all today. Um, my role in the Now Crowd is I am on the board um, and we kind of look at how we can support you all um, in your journeys of enacting sustainability in your organizations. Um, what I do, I work at EcoStore as a sustainability manager. You probably saw a little um, media coverage of us this week. Um, so yeah, working on a cool amount of projects there, um, but I'm also going into some study soon. So yeah, we'll be entering a new chapter in journey and sustainability, um, researching eco-anxiety as well. So. Happy to be here, happy to be here and talking to Olivia Philpot. Um, and yeah, talking about um, Tamaki's water shortage and, and what we need to know um, and questions um, that will be really relevant to everyone in the region and most likely outside of Tamaki as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be a bit of a, a, bit of a casual Q&A session um, with myself leading the questions um, and Olivia will be running us through things from a water care perspective. Um, Olivia is the sustainability lead and of the Central Interceptor project at Water Care Services Limited um, and yeah, really excited to have her here today. So before we jump in, I'll give you a bit of a background on the Now Crowd for anyone tuning in who doesn't know us, um, as well as a bit of background on SBN. So um, the Now Crowd is a network of young professionals who are in the early stages of their careers and are eager to drive sustainability initiatives within their organizations. The Now Crowd aims to help young people build capability, confidence and impact in sustainability. And we do this by providing tools, resources, events, mentorships. Uh, we have been going for two years now and has some really epic results coming out from some of our um, people and getting sustainability moving in their organizations, which is super, super exciting. Um, if you are keen to get involved in the Now Crowd, now is definitely a great time. Um, actually, if your business is a member of SBN, um, we have now changed the requirements. So any young professional from a SBN business that's involved in the network can join the Now Crowd now, which is really, really exciting. Um, so more details on that, I'm sure, on our social channels, etc. Um, and if you're keen to join, um, or if co-workers you think would be keen to join, please email kiora at nowcrowd.org.nz. Um, but the Now Crowd wouldn't be possible without SBN. Um, SBN is New Zealand's or Aotearoa's largest um, longest standing sustainable business organization. It includes 600 organizations around the country um, across many industries. Um, so this year, there's a big focus on climate, waste and water. And if you haven't seen SBN's new strategy, 100% recommend you check that out. It's all around impact investing and being a part of this movement of change because um, we're all ready for that. So that is, yeah, really incredible um, and exciting stuff. So I encourage you to check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah, so um, another last thing to note before we welcome Olivia to the chat is that um, we won't be doing live questions today. So if you do have a question and you're watching, please email us at kiora at nowcrowd.org.nz and we will get those answers back to you from Olivia and Watercare. Uh, but without further ado, let's um, welcome Olivia to the chat and channel today. Kia ora, thank you for that welcome. No problem. And wow, eco anxiety, I didn't know you were looking into that, but that is a very apt topic. I don't think there's any sort of young sustainably, sustainability minded people who haven't mm. experienced some level of that for sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's massive. Yeah, it's really yeah. excited to sink my teeth in there. Nice, yeah. yeah. Good, um, especially with, I guess, COVID anxiety and, and all of these other anxiety stuff that's coming up. Yeah. So. Yeah, mm, mm. absolutely. 
but yeah thank you so much for being here olivia um no and thanks for having me yeah i'm really excited to jump in um so yeah let's let's do that um i guess the first question is what's currently going on with the water situation in um in Taunaki in auckland um yeah well let me just pull up an infographic here uh so normally what we'd be seeing for this time um, of the year would be seeing around 87 percent of our dams being full um, and at the moment they're just sitting at around 60 percent um, and a big reason for that is the first four months of this year were the driest that we've ever had on record um, so we are heading into um, a summer where we haven't had the recharge over the winter period and we're kind of in that second phase of drought now so we're not having that resilience um, as we come towards summer. Um, we, we share these graphics on our website at the beginning of every week for people who are interested so um, you can always just find them there if you want to follow along. Great yeah wow that's um that's quite shocking I guess I don't remember being in a drought like this um, so yeah it's, it's yeah the, the last one of this scale where we actually put restrictions in was 93 94 so oh, when i was born <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah wow so a long time ago yeah. yeah shoot okay so um i guess what is water care doing to ensure this doesn't happen again or, or to manage what's going on right now yeah, so we've got a, a series of sort of different approaches. So in terms of augmenting new sources, um, we've got the Pukekohe Boar and the Hayes Creek projects going on. And those were both um, decommissioned a few years ago or a while back, um, mainly because their treatment plants would have required significant upgrades. And because they only provide a small um, amount of the water demand, they weren't considered super necessary. And so we're re-bringing those online this year. And then in addition, um, our Pukekohe East Reservoir systems are on track to be finished this month actually. And so they'll enable us to deliver the full um, amount of water from our Waikato water treatment plant. So we've got a series of um, you know, augmentation of new sources. But then in addition to that, we're doing a series obviously of kind of big education and communications about uh, lowering your water consumption on an individual level. Um, you might have seen like our Water Saving Heroes campaign. Yeah, um, yeah, saw that. We're also, it <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a bit fun and kind of different yeah. way to engage kids and things as well. Um, and then we're also working with um, other parties such as Hamilton City Council to look at um, using and accessing their water that's allocated but not used at the moment. Um, and then in addition, we're looking and addressing our non-revenue water loss, which is theft and leaks is one of the main things. And so leaks come from a variety of different reasons. So um, can, there's obviously heaps of construction in Auckland at the moment. And so you get third parties striking the pipes that can cause leaks um, and also vibration in the ground can shift pipes. And then also just aging infrastructure of the assets. Um, and as the earth dries out, some of the pipes can shift and cause little cracks. Um, and also our, because we are hilly, our geography is that we've got a lot of hills. A lot of our water system is pressurized, so it's pumped. And that causes more stress on the water network, so more likely to cause leaks. Um, for kind of an equivalent, um, Amsterdam is very flat, and so they only have about 6% leaks, which is kind of a world-leading um, level. You're never going to get a transmission system that doesn't leak. That's damn near impossible. Um, uh, we've got around 13% of leakage, um, and for comparison, London has 25%, which I think is largely based on their age. So you've got all these leaks. Um, we have a proactive leak detection program that we've accelerated because of the drought. Um, so the program's already covered 500 kilometres of pipes, uh, and that's preventing leaks of roughly 200 million litres a day. Um, and we aim to have covered 6,000 kilometres of pipes, which is roughly two-thirds of our network by this time next year. Um, and just a quick addition, 
I may flip between saying megalitres and million litres per day. That's the same stat. So that's the unit that we generally work in is millions of litres per day. Wow. Yeah, it's um, something you don't really think about. Hey, like you turn on a tap and it's just this thing that, yeah, is always there. But there's obviously so much that goes on behind yeah. the scenes. And that sounds like a lot of projects you've got going on. So, um, yeah, keep up the mahi. Yeah, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, that gives me a, a fair idea of, of what's currently happening, which is great. Um, but what other, I guess, source alternatives or what's the kind of future term long-term plan that you're considering at the moment yeah so there's there's a lot of planning that goes into thinking about future water sources um, so for example when we applied for the Waikato water take we actually assessed 77 different potential water sources and each of them had their social economic environmental and cultural factors assessed um, and kind of weighing the costs and benefits and another thing we're really cognizant of at the moment at Watercare is that we need sources that are drought resistant um, to improve our resilience as an organization. And so things like wastewater reuse and desal, those are very highly drought resistant. Um, things like the Waikato River are certainly more drought resistant than uh, dams, which, you know, they're, they're a large pond. Once they're empty, they're dry, you know. Um, we don't have any more large aquifers or bores available to us and a lot of the major dams have already been built. Um, so some of those more drought resilient sources are not without their own complications. So wastewater reuse, there's two options kind of open where you treat the wastewater and then uh, dilute it through a natural waterway, so maybe a lake or an aquifer. Um, and then take it out later as um, potable water and then treat it that way. So they do that, I know, in Perth, they recharge an aquifer. And then there's clothes where it's fully through an engineered system where you treat the wastewater and then take it straight to the potable water. Um, so with the wastewater reuse, there's currently a legislative and regulatory gap in that space. So currently, uh, drinking water standards don't allow for any kind of wastewater reuse for potable drinking. So there would need to be um, an update nationally for us to even be able to consider that a viable option. Um, and then in addition to that, we'd need to socialise it and start this discussion, not only with the Ministry of Health, but also with our communities and our customers, because there's definitely an ick factor associated with wastewater reuse. You think about it and yeah, you just can't yeah. quite get your head around it. You're like, oh. So there's a yeah. big socialising piece to do, particularly, you know, we've got people of all different kinds of mindsets and, you know, it's not just engineers who understand the complexities of it, but you've got to kind of um, helping people along on the journey, including mana whenua as well. We need to have those discussions as to the suitability of the options. Um, and then desalination really quickly. This is one that kind of, in theory, seems like a silver bullet. It's like there's water in the sea. It's always going to be there. Let's go with that. Uh, and yeah. there's a couple of big issues with that. One is the concentration of brine. So once you've extracted the fresh water, you've got a really concentrated discharge to deal with. And the other is just the sheer amount of energy um, requirements and associated greenhouse gases, which really can't be overestimated, they're, they're insane. So Watercare did look at desal as an option during this drought, um, and it has been sort of decided that we're not in favor of that option because of the really high energy requirements and the associated environmental uh, and costs associated with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's a lot of planning going on and we are moving towards designing for membrane technology um, when we're upgrading water treatment plants and wastewater plants. So that would allow us to be ready for wastewater reuse um, in the future. And then we also have a big drought team looking at the feasibility of these large scale options. So if anyone's curious about how we currently treat water and wastewater, we have some really great informative videos on our website and I'll make sure that those can be linked out afterwards. Awesome. Wow. I, I learned so much in, in that short, <laughs> short spell. Goodness. Um, you said water membrane. Could you just clarify what, what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, th these are used currently in our Waikato water treatment plants, and they're effectively a, an enhanced uh, system for measuring water, uh, sorry, not measuring water, um, treating water. Right. And so they, they look like almost like baleen of a whale's mouth. They're kind of these straw things, and they suck the water through tiny little holes, um, and that filters out a lot of um, pathogens and things. So it's effectively a more advanced type of treatment. We don't have it in all of our plants because the water that comes through from our protected catchments um, in the Hanuas and Waitakere is, is really pristine quality. So it's more for water that's not quite at that level. Right. Yeah, and that's exciting um, news on, I mean, the potential to use wastewater because, yeah, that would, that would be something I'd be looking forward to as well. Um, yeah. yeah, it's definitely like a long-term thing. Um, yeah. But it's, it's something that is done internationally and it's mm. certainly one of the main options mm. going forward to look at. Mm. And also in Auckland, um, we can have water tanks now that there's a new law that, that's very cool too. So yeah, yeah exciting, exciting things happening in that space. Um, well, on, on I guess dams, um, why can't we just build some more other than the fact that they're not drought resistant? What are the other reasons we don't build more dams? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the dams have, and the storage lake, so the dam is the engineering structure, the storage lake being the water um, stored behind it. They have quite a complex hydrological system. So you've got the catchment, which is kind of all this, all this forested area, the storage lake, and then any associated networks and treatment plants. So obviously it requires a lot of land. And one thing in Auckland we don't have a huge amount of is available space. Um, the, the catchments are protected, so there's not any forestry, uh, oh, sorry, a farming or housing or industry allowed in those areas. And so they do, you know, take up a lot of land. And then on top of that, um, we, the dams have a lot of factors in terms of social, environmental and cultural and they have to be weighed with the benefits. And so given that they're not uh, drought resistant, they're not necessarily gonna be the best options for us. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, that, makes, that makes some sense. So why can't we make the current storage lakes bigger? Is that a similar answer or? Um, it's a fair question for sure. So it's, it's a little bit complicated because dams aren't just sort of a big puddle effectively. So this is the dam face here, this grass patch. And underneath this, commonly dams are made up of some sort of steel, concrete, engineered structure to um, hold in the water. And, it, and they're designed to hold a certain capacity. So if we were to dig this dam deeper, uh, the face would not likely be sufficient to hold that same volume or weight of water which uh, it could then fail, and that would be completely catastrophic to everything downstream. Um, mm. In addition to that, we'd have to drain and keep those lakes empty while we did that work. Um, and, you know, dams are not just, as I said, a big puddle. They've got spillways around here and intake towers and things. So those would either need to be built taller or deeper. And that would mean those dams would be out of use, out of commission for a number of years. Um, and then another factor, uh, I guess slightly less of a factor, but when you would start doing earthworks, you'd um, stir up a lot of silt and sediment that settled on the bottom, and that would mean a reduced water quality, um, both for our intakes, but also our compensation flows. Right, yeah. Is that Hanua, by the way? I think I've... <laughs> Um, that one, let me just, um, I that like one I've I done think, that walk across the yes, <laughs> it is down in the Hernuas, yeah, I can't yeah. quite remember if it's Mangatangi or Mangatafari, oh. but yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I guess back to water tanks then, as we kind of lightly touched on before. Yeah. Um, you know, why, why wouldn't water care um, help fund those if they could be a potential solution? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, water tanks is something we've looked at in quite a lot of detail uh, multiple times. Um, so they are fantastic for households and water care certainly educates on the use of them and people privately are enabled to use them because of our user pay system. So if you save money, if you're using your own water for 
um, you know, non-potable uses. One of the complexities that has been removed recently, I think you touched on just before, is that Auckland Council required a consent for water tanks over 1.5 metres high. Um, and so recently in the last couple of months, um, that consent has been loosened and the fees associated have been removed. Um, Auckland Council has a tool called Do I Need a Consent? So if anyone's curious, they can go look that up. But we have done a lot of assessments and in droughts that last a long time, one thing is that private water tanks are going to be empty, you know, after a few mm. months of drought. Um, and we had this example in February this year, even when we had our highest ever demand on history. One day we had a demand of 568 million litres a day, mm. when our, our usual demand is 440. Um, and we know that some of this can be attributed to private tanks that had run out of water, needed to be filled up by our tankers, and they filled up at our filling stations that we provided. Mm. Um, and so the water provided to these filling stations was equivalent to roughly 28,000 new people on our network. Yeah. Um, and so in those cases, reliable reticulated water is more efficient and we would still need to have the infrastructure in place to be able to enable that. Um, and then one other thing we did in 2015, we carried out a study to look at the benefits of a wide scale uptake of private water, rainwater tanks. Um, and we found that in normal periods, rainwater tanks provide a significant contribution towards household water needs. Um, but during drought, that benefit really does reduce. Um, so we'd still need other sources to meet demand. Um, the outputs of that study demonstrated that tanks could supply between 16 and 35% of the additional uh, amount needed between now and 2050. Um, but that option would actually cost four times more than a, an alternative water source yeah. that could provide 100% of that demand. So in terms of um, being the best option for resilience, water tanks are not looking like the most preferable option in terms of how we spend our customers' money. Mm -hmm. that, make, that makes sense. Um, yeah. 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 yeah, but that being said, there's nothing to stop private homeowners putting in small water tanks um, for you know, non-potable use. And Watercare does give away rain barrels um, at the Go Green Expo. We have a stand oh, with cool. Eco Matters Trust every year. Um, and there's definitely other things that are benefits of having a, you know, in-house rainwater. So these are the barrels that we give away here. Um, oh, cool. But you also, you increase your water literacy and your understanding of consumption it's obviously got runoff impacts, you know, you're collecting your stormwater rather than having to deal with it in the stormwater network. And also you're increasing your household's resilience in emergency situations if there's an extreme natural event or something. So there's certainly a good thing to have for households to have, but in terms of, I guess, drought resilience and widespread use, they're perhaps not the most ideal option. Sure, yeah. Um, but you, can, you, you said for free, right? That's awesome to get the tank. Is it? Free or you um, just sell them? We we give away to as part of a, a prize through our systems. Yeah. 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 Oh, ah, yeah. cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I guess a lot of people will be thinking um, with the drought and you know always hearing driest year on record or hottest year on record and all these things. Um, is any of this linked to um, with the drought in particular a, a result of climate change? Yeah, there's sort of almost a million dollar question in a way. Um, so there's, it's really important to first differentiate between weather and climate. So weather being the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month events that we're experiencing and climate being the really long-term trends. So there's some schools of thought that you, you can't actually define a data set as climate change um, until it's 50 years of data. So it's, it's pretty yeah. difficult to track that. Um, and NIWA's position is that you can't attribute any specific events to climate change. However, the events we're seeing have what they call a fingerprint of climate change. So they're exactly what we expect to see. Um, and on top of that, I think it's fair to say, based on the projections that we have, you know, we have some really good specific projections uh, for Auckland that NIWA produced for us. Um, 
we can expect to be seeing these kind of events more frequently and at an increased intensity, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so how do you balance environmental needs with the need for water supply? Yeah, absolutely. That's a question that I actually get asked quite a lot from environmental friends and things. Um, and so all of Watercare's dams have an environmental or compensation flow. And this goes via a free discharge valve to the downstream environment. And this helps to maintain plant and animal habitats downstream. Um, and effectively ensures that our dams don't adversely impact the environments. And that, that flow rate is set by rigorous environmental assessment. Mm. Um, and then in addition to that, we have quite an extensive fish and eel migration program that our dam techs are involved with. So um, we trap juvenile native fish and eels uh, that are stuck downstream and transport them upstream of our dams. And then in addition, um, our adult eels migrate to the Pacific Ocean towards the end of their lives to breed. They go near Tonga and they only breed once in their life. Um, just when they're kind of at the end of their life. So we um, trap eels that are stuck in our dams because we do have lots of eels in our dams. Um, we trap them and we release them downstream to kind of continue their journey to Tonga. Um, mm. Particularly because some of these eels are a declining species. So we want to make sure that they can reach the ocean to kind of continue their survival as a species. So that's really important to us. I think it's fair to say our dams were built in the 20th century, so between kind of 1900 and 1970s. And, you know, working to current environmental standards and knowing what we know about drought resilience and the options, it's unlikely that dams would be a preferable option to go forward with in terms of land use and environmental effects. But they certainly provide us with very pristine water and mm. we definitely do a lot of work to ensure that their impacts are um, minimised in terms of the downstream environment. Great, yeah. Um, nothing like a, a river with eels in it. Eh? It's so <laughs> even, kiwi. Yeah, or even Western Springs Park and we're like, oh, can be any eels? And anyway, yeah. um, I digress. <laughs> um, what a about any environmental impacts um, from taking from the Waikato River? Um, are there limitations, restrictions on that? Um, yeah, curious about that one. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the Waikato River near our intake um, area. So we are consented as water care to take 150 million litres a day from the Waikato. And then on top of that, we have what's called a winter harvest consent. So that means that between the months of May and October, when the river is above a median level, we're allowed to take an additional 25 million litres a day. Um, the river this year only hit that level on the 2nd of July and it hasn't stayed above it, so it's kind of fluctuated. So some days we can take up to 175 million litres a day, some days not. Um, and so the environmental assessments associated with our proposed new take which would enable us to take up to 350 million litres a day, have found that it would have very little impact on the Waikato River. Um, the water level would change uh, roughly two centimetres. Um, and in addition to that, our plant is located um, kind of closest to the Port Waikato mouth. So that's an area where 15 billion litres of water flow out from the Waikato River every day. Um, so for it to sort of be an additional 200 million litres, um, the effects are deemed not significant. Um, and also the Waikato water treatment plant actually used to be two dairy farms. So we bought the land, retired um, the dairy farms and built our plant as well as planting and foresting a lot of that area. Wow, cool. It sounds like, yeah, a lot of thought and, um, and a rigorous scientific evaluations have gone in there so that's that's really great yeah. to hear um yeah great great um i guess the next one would be how has water care responded to small businesses that have been impacted by these restrictions absolutely yeah so um upon water care's request auckland council put in 
restrictions for outdoor use in May. Uh, so that's stage one restrictions. And we worked with Auckland Council's Healthy Waters Department to um, provide filling stations where businesses can have access to non-potable or untreated water um, free of charge. So that's for anyone who has you know, water blasting or um, car washing kind of businesses. Um, and so this is fully funded by Watercare. Um, and we have a list of these businesses on our website and we give them shout outs on our social media to sort of help recognize their efforts and thank them for their support. A big thing is that we hope some of these businesses will retain these new practices um, of using non-potable water, even after the restrictions, because the concept of fit for purpose water is really coming to the forefront now. And, um, you know, the fact that we regularly use perfectly good drinking water that has had, um, you know, it has embodied energy and associated practices and, po and processes, um, using that water to wash um, cars and um, mm. wash down spoil from trucks and things isn't the best use yeah. of that kind of water. Yeah. Totally, that makes sense. Um, are there any world leading countries um, who are doing really good practice or best practice um, when it comes to water? And could you share some of those? Yeah, so the, actually the, the best and most efficient water users in the world are in Copenhagen, Denmark. Mm -hmm. um, so they use per person per day 104 litres, whereas Aucklanders use 167 litres a day. So roughly 60 litres more. Um, and what's interesting is perhaps one of the reasons for that is that uh, the water supply in Denmark costs over nine times more than it does here in Auckland. So mm -hmm. they pay the equivalent of about $14.80 for a 1,000 litres, which is one cubic metre of water, um, whereas we charge around $1.50 or $1.60 for a 1,000 litres. So um, that user pays mentality is probably coming through for them. Um, Aucklanders are absolutely some of the most water efficient users in the country because of that user pay system. I've had a few new flatmates move in over the years and they say, can't believe you have to pay for water. Um, it's like, well, <laughs> everybody pays for water and you're not paying for the, the water itself, you're paying for all the infrastructure yeah. to enable it to get to you safely. Um, and it's just that we have a water bill which tracks it based on a per litre system rather than being wrapped up as a lump sum in your rates um, as with other places in, in New Zealand. Um, so in terms of leaders though internationally, um, for reuse, places like Singapore and the United States have quite widespread, um, well-adopted wastewater reuse. And those are some of the leaders that we'll be looking to um, going forward. I know um, Brisbane has some reuse, but it's more for industrial purposes. Um, they invested quite heavily during the millennium drought between 2000 and 2008, but the drought broke before they actually commissioned that wastewater reuse plant um, or the, the pipelines to become potable. So it never actually got used yet, but the infrastructure is there if they did need it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I imagine they they get a lot more droughts than than we do. They'd be quite well versed in. Yeah. Or okay. as an Australian uh, co-worker said to me last week, a real drought. Uh, <laughs> true. A real drought. Yeah. A real drought. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do think there's a lot of learnings we can have from Australia. You know, they've dealt with it for a much longer time, um, mm -hmm. and we're almost in our infancy with dealing with these things. We're We've prepared and we've had that 94 drought, which gave us a lot of information and um, preparedness. But in terms of experiencing long um, droughts that we might expect to see more with climate change, I think there's some great learnings to have internationally. Mm, yeah. yeah, totally, totally. Another hot topic. Um, what about companies that want to use our bottle, or want to use our water to create bottled water and sell it overseas um is that yeah how is water care addressing that yeah absolutely i mean as both a sustainability professional and um a water care or water industry member i can't despise anything more than bottled water you know you see bottled water on someone's desk at work and you're, oh, um, because it's just you know 
money wise it makes no sense environmentally horrific you know we all kind of i think are probably on the same page here on this call we all get it um in terms of auckland so we as far to the best of our knowledge we don't actually have any companies that bottle our water and sell it overseas um and a lot so a lot of those companies i gather take water from aquifers which is a council controlled process right. we're quite lucky that we don't have any um at least to the best of our knowledge you never know who's turning on a tap and filling up a bottle and shipping it somewhere but to the best of our knowledge they're not um on our network and we're quite glad for that yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's um, definitely one of those hot, hot topics, isn't it? Yeah, um, I know yeah. it's happening other places in New Zealand, but um, mm -hmm. don't believe it's happening on the Water Care Network. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess back to the, the drought side of things. Um, it's the middle of winter. We're getting a bit of rain. Should it, you know, is it all going to be okay because of that? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so I guess there's a few elements to that. So based on our forecasts, we're looking at quite a dry spring. So we're expecting 18% less rainfall than usual, um, which means we're going to come into summer with, um, a, you know, we usually have a full dam, which puts us um, on a good footing for summertime. Mm -hmm. But we're now kind of on a back foot. We don't have as much of the recharge. So they're starting lower than we'd expect. Um, and so even though we're seeing a lot of rain perhaps in the CBD or the North Shore or even in the Waitaka areas where we do have some dams, we're not seeing a lot of that rain in the Hanua Ranges, which is where um, quite a big majority of our water storage is in the uh, Hanua dams. Um, so down south, we're not having that water. And I guess there's a, a huge complexity in over or underestimating and the concept of kind of being proactive. So if we overinvested in water infrastructure, um, that would be you know, the wrong thing to do by our customers because they would have to pay for it in their bills. And we then have water infrastructure sitting there unused and degrading over time. Um, just to kind of put it in perspective, these two pictures here um, are of one of the Hanua dams and it's the, the same dam. You can see that um, intake tower and bridge structure behind it. But um, this is the water level um, on a normal winter. You can see it mm. spilling in there. And this is that same tower more recently in the last month or so. So that water level is, is really down. So even though we're confident with our Waikato water river take, you know, Aucklanders aren't going to run out of water to drink. You know, it's not like you're not gonna be able to get a glass of water. Um, but we are certainly, you know, this picture really puts it into perspective for me in that it's pretty serious and we, we do need people to be making sure they save water to the best of their abilities. Um, it's kind of, we've got the COVID team of 5 million and maybe we've got the Auckland water saving team of 1.5 million or 2 million. Mm -hmm. So um, that's kind of how I like to look at it. Yeah. And kind of share oh, yeah. water saving tips and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, um, what are your, your water saving tips for us all watching? Yeah, good question. So I guess, I mean, you've got all the basic ones, right? Like stop the tap when you're brushing your teeth, only do a full load of laundry, um, those kind of things. But I've come up with a couple over the last, I guess, six months that, you know, you, you tailor it to your own lifestyle, right? Um, so one thing I started doing over the last, not the last lockdown, we're not in lockdown yet, but the lockdown, um, was sudsing up my shampoo and body wash with the tap turned off. So, you know, kind of rinse yourself and then turn the tap off, suds up, and then rinse again. And especially if you've got long hair, you know that shampooing can actually take a decent while and you don't really need the water running during that time. Even though it's a tiny bit tough during winter, it's a bit chilly, but <laughs> it kind of does make you move faster and get on with it. Um, and another funny one I've done, and it's, it's almost more the principle of it and kind of to get conversations started when you're sitting at a cafe or a restaurant is when a glass of water comes in front of you at the table or a bottle, um, I don't let that glass go undrunk. When I leave the cafe, I'm like, no, I'm going to finish my water. We're not leaving until I finish. Scull the water. Um, and it's kind of almost more of a mentality of just not being mind, mindlessly wasteful. Um, you know, you're actually thinking about it and it can start conversations with your 
friends as well, which can be quite fun to just chat about and share tips. Um, I'm a bit of a water savings geek, so that makes <laughs> it less cool than I think it is. <laughs> no, it's very cool. It's very cool. And I mean, Watercare do fund those free audits that I mentioned um, through the Eco Matters Trust. So Eco Matters will make a time, come to your house, and they'll look for leaks and they'll assess the water efficiency of your home and things. And that's a fully funded free service um, from Watercare and Eco Matters. So We'll also send out the link to that for anyone who's curious about if they even just suspect they might have a leak in their home, that's a good way mm. to get it looked at for free. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's free to any water care customers. Um, yeah. But I'm curious, do you have any water saving activities that you've been doing over the last wee while? Um, yeah, definitely shorter showers, uh, <laughs> which is unfortunate yeah. in winter, but um now that I'm working from home again, sometimes I do a cold shower um, just to wake me up. <laughs> so maybe I'll yeah. do those and get the showers even shorter. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess all the usual ones like, you know, not washing your car with, um, or just at the moment. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think those are the main ones. But I like yeah. the, cafe. the cafe idea is quite cool. Mm. Yeah, I know a, a common one that people have been doing. If your shower takes a long time to warm up, they just capture the cold water in a bucket and then they can use that to either wash veggies, wash the dog, flush the toilet yeah. even. Yeah. yeah, especially if you've got a shower that does take 20 seconds to warm up or something. Mm -hmm. You may as well capture that water. It's perfectly good drinking water, so don't let it just go down the drain. Um, yeah. Some families have a, if it's yellow, let it mellow system. Yeah. Um, if you're yeah. flooding, you might yeah. not want to go for that option, but, um, or you might not want to encourage your children to not flush. Um, yeah, not sure. being a mother myself, it's probably not something I can comment on. <laughs> you're trying to yeah. educate them on so many things, but yeah. um, I do know there's some people at Watercare who have taken that approach. Why not, hey? The saying exactly. came about for a reason, I guess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's so good. And hey, we'd love to hear the other networks or the members of the network's tips as well. So maybe we could hear back, shoot us a line if you've got tips as well. Because um, yeah, that, that has been a really informative chat. That was actually our last question. Um, and yeah, I really I really enjoyed it. I, I didn't really know what to, to expect on water but I guess it just gives me so much more gratitude for the work that goes on behind the scenes um, for something that we often take for granted um, yeah and I'll definitely be able to um, call up some good water facts to my flatmates tonight <laughs> yeah absolutely you get a bit geeky after a while I remember yeah. like when we do um, tours of our treatment plants that are open to the public and yeah. I remember sending that to like a group chat with all my friends once and I was like, hey guys, I think this is really cool. Like you like, get to know how, what happens to your poo after it's gone kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> no one replied. And then <laughs> someone texts me individually and they're like, you've lost all sense of what is a cool day out, Olivia. Like, <laughs> that is so good. Yeah, but is so knowledge is power, right? Like it's always cool okay. to know these things and have a bit of an understanding of yeah. what goes on to just turning on the tap yeah absolutely yeah. um and i'll definitely be taking away yeah a few more of those those tips um to put into practice i really like the cold shower one and yeah just encourage all of the members to have a think about that um and i guess that was yeah it was our last question so we'll wrap it up there and thank you so much olivia for um your time today and sharing those insights um, and Absolutely. thanks so much for having yeah. me. Yeah, thank you. And thanks everyone else for tuning in. I hope you're all having a relaxing day, easing back into working from home. And um, just reiterating, if you have any questions, please um, post it in the Facebook group or email us. Um, if anyone's not a member or you've got kind of colleagues or people you know who want to join or who might be a SBN Business Network member, um, also get in touch. Um, yeah, and keep a look out for our email updates. Again, if you're not getting those, get in touch. <laughs> a bit of a theme there. And um, yeah, just a massive thank you overall. And everyone, just get in touch if you need COVID's an interesting time we're here for you um, as best we can and yeah that's probably all from me um, but again thanks everyone and have a beautiful rest of your day cool